The two most close constitutional precedents are the Lopez decision in 95 and the Morrison decision in 2000. Both of those, as you know, were regulations of non-commercial activity. So they're analogous in one respect in that the Supreme Court, of course, struck both congressional enactments down. It said that if the conduct being regulated is non-economic, then even if it has a substantial effect on interstate commerce, and it admitted that violence against women, which was the, the issue in the Morrison case, clearly affects interstate commerce, dramatically so. But if that conduct is non-economic, the links must be direct. It must not be too speculative. Well, here's two reasons to argue, I, I think pretty persuasively, that the individual mandate is even more clearly unconstitutional than what the court struck down in Lopez and Morrison. And one is, it, it's, it's analogous in that it's non-economic conduct, this thought crime, this thought crime not to buy an insurance policy, not to engage in commerce. Um, but it's not even activity at all. So this is, would be an additional step the Supreme Court would have to, and the, and the Supreme Court was unwilling to take that step in Morrison and Ver Lopez, it would have to take an addition. The second is, is that in the Gun-Free School Zone Act in Lopez and the Violence Against Women Act in, at, at issue in Morrison were very popular acts of Congress. And the Supreme Court had to show some fortitude. And you know, there were screaming and wailing when those, those, those little provisions were, were, were struck down. This is a case where the Supreme Court knows that the individual mandate is decidedly unpopular to require people to buy inflated uh, insurance policies to subsidize other government programs. And so it would take an awful lot for the court, the court would have no reason, would have every good reason not to create new doctrine. Well, beyond that, let me just tick off uh, four quick reasons why the Supreme Court would not create this new doctrine. Uh, point number one, five members of the current court take the original public meaning of the text very seriously, at least when there's no precedent. The gun case out of DC, Heller, is a perfect example of that. When there isn't controlling precedent, the five of them take the original meaning very seriously. But the decision last Thursday in Citizen United shows that there are five of them even willing to overturn past precedents to, uh, to move back toward the original meaning of the Constitution. Two, the court will realize that if Congress can mandate that we purchase insurance because our inactivity has an effect on commerce, they will realize that Congress can do anything. And that is a proposition the Supreme Court has time and time again said is not the case. Think of the text of the Tenth Amendment. They would have to, they've always maintained that there is some line. And in the Lopez decision, if you look, read the oral, if you look at the oral argument transcript and you read the opinion, they say, if you can't come up with a theory that we can distinguish in the future from enumerated power, constitutional, non-enumerated power, then, then it's unconstitutional. And I submit to you, you, no matter what creative theory you come up with to say that, that Congress can do this, would be very clear that it would render Congress uh, with unlimited power. For example, as, uh, as our paper pointed out, Congress could simply order us to buy a new Chevy Impala every year. It, who cares what we do with our old cars? Ship them to China, I suppose. Um, it, clearly, the federal government is invested in GM and, and Chrysler, and um, uh, there would be no, and so the, the, there are f at least five members of the court that will never do that. Three, they will also know that this act of Congress wasn't necessary to win a war, to, uh, to solve a depression, that some of the traditional reasons why the court is sometimes deferred to the political branches, in fact, they will know quite the opposite. They will know that this might imperil our, our economics. And, and finally, uh, relates to that, they will know, as opposed to some of the other acts where the court has flinched, that there are, there are constitutional ways for Congress to do this. And if you think of the line item veto case and some other cases, um, the court has said, listen, Form does matter. There are constitutional ways for you to do that. You have to pay for it. Um, so for all those reasons, the court isn't going to do that. Now, I'm just going to talk about the, the tax uh, authority, and I think I've exceeded my time a little bit. The, the other panelists said I could. I, I thought I wouldn't, but I'm, I'm sorry to do so. Um, the the uh, 
this is, there's, there's three reasons why the so-called tax penalty is unconstitutional. I only understand two of them, so I'll let some tax attorney maybe address the third. Um, but one is it's not a tax at all. Uh, the Senate bill doesn't even call it a tax. It calls it a personal responsibility penalty payment or something. And the reason is obvious. Um, it isn't a tax on some commercial activity. It's not anything like that. And uh, if we, we, we just think about other analogies, uh, Congress cannot um, say it's a tax if you vote Democrat or a tax if you vote Republican. Everyone who doesn't vote Democrat, doesn't prove that they voted Democrat, has to pay this and, therefore, and we have taxing authority, so therefore it's constitutional. If the underlying mandate is unconstitutional, whatever this is called is not. And even the Congressional, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Congressional Research Service, which is normally very um, generous in its interpretation of congressional power said that whatever this is, this so-called penalty, it falls or, or doesn't fall depending on the constitutionality of the underlying mandate. If the underlying mandate is constitutional, yeah, I suppose the federal government can, can beat us over the head, but not otherwise. Uh, the, the other reason is even if it is a tax, then there's a second problem, and that is it's a capitation tax. And here's where I'm getting in. Uh, their tax lawyers help me out here. But, but I have on good authority from my co-author, and I've at least read the cases to make sure I could put my name to it, that even after the 16th Amendment, the Supreme Court has set, well, just the capitation tax, obviously, this is on, on individuals uh, per individual rather than, um, you know, based on income or, 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 or something else. Um, and this clearly would be a capitation tax. But even after the 16th Amendment, the Supreme Court has said capitation taxes must be apportioned according to population. And this mandate would not, because certain states have much bigger Medicaid. There's all sorts of exemptions. Um, and those exemptions would show that it's not at all remotely uh, apportioned according to, uh, uh, to population. So uh, given that there's no constitutional authority for this, um, I certainly think that beyond all the other things that I don't understand in this bill and think that Congress should fix, the highest obligation of members of Congress who take an oath to defend the Constitution is to eliminate unconstitutional provisions. Good job.